Okay, I will uh, greet everyone. Welcome. It's one, right? Yeah. Most welcome to uh, this session in our ecclesiology uh, series. Uh, today we have not a guest, but sometimes it feels like having a guest when Dafer is speaking because he's always introducing new perspectives of things that we took for granted. And it's the same thing here. Uh, last time he lectured, I compared him with Michel Foucault, who always deconstructed most of the obvious Western ways of thinking. And I think we have uh, the same pattern again uh, with Duffer, a uh, way of deconstructing what we think would be obvious. And the name of his lecture is simply Political Theology, the Sacralization of the Secular, and Post, within uh, parentheses, modern, illiberal, all liberal paradigms. And <clears throat> since the very beginning of the office of arrival here in, in Sweden, he has been mostly caught in an isolated situation uh, during this corona pandemic. <laughs> I think it's more than half of the time now of his employment. Uh, and he still produces a lot and he still uh, interacts with the world. And I think he has found a new dimension, the two dimensional reality. And here he is breaking down the reality of our view of what liberalism could mean or could not mean, and also what sacralization could or could not mean. I welcome you, Dafer, to uh, challenge us to think both what political theology could be and could not be, potentially could be understood as. The floor, the screen is yours. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for your kind introduction. Uh, I doubt you will hear in this presentation anything really new. Most of those things that I'm gonna uh, mention or, or slightly develop are already known, but maybe toward the end of the presentation and especially during the discussion, we can actually uh, push more and push forward some of the questions and issues and explore some uh, new ways of thinking about the sociopolitical in its relationship with the religious or uh, religions, one or, or many. Uh, it's uh, the after lunch time in Sweden, so if you already had your lunch, you can also take this opportunity to take a nap. And I'll try to keep my presentation just long enough that you can get a decent nap uh, before the discussion. Uh, but I can warn you that most of those ideas, modern ideas and modern uh, paths of modern thinking uh, are actually normally stranger than anything we can uh, encounter in our dreams. Uh, so it might also make sense to skip a nap uh, now and uh, try to immerse uh, all of us together into uh, some of those modern, typically modern uh, avenues of thinking that very often are strange, stranger than fiction, as it were, uh, and normally justified based on reason and rationality. So it is something worth of thinking. Last time when I gave this lecture that Michael mentioned at the beginning uh, in the previous semester, I pointed out that modernity begins with bad theologies. Uh, and I won't mention many things that, that I uh, tried to uh, outline or develop last time, but I would like to proceed uh, down that road. and. Uh, say at the beginning that uh, although it begins with bad theologies, it continues also with pseudo theologies for most of the time. And here I'm basically just paraphrasing Carl Schmitt, who pointed out that virtually all of our concepts uh, used within the socio-political realm, especially for the purposes of political theory uh, or political philosophy, uh, are actually secularized 
uh, religious concepts and ideas. This whole story, of course, goes back to the late medieval period and the crisis that uh, what we called uh, late Middle Ages uh, brought. And one of those crises, of course, I'm not going to uh, go here into details, but uh, just mention that one dimension of the crisis, crisis or the crises that uh, were unfolding uh, toward the end of, of that period is the crisis of authority. Of course, based on the crisis of some of the very foundational metaphysical ideas and concepts came the crisis of authority, political authority, and came the question how to legitimize the political and social and political sphere. What should it be based on? And this presentation will primarily uh, explore that question. What are the foundations of a polity? What is a political uh, community? What is based on? How does it work as a political community? In, of course, this modern, modern period. Uh, one dimension of the crisis, of course, uh, uh, that we find at the very beginning of modernity uh, has to do with the rise of the new bourgeois class and has to do with many changes. We cannot go into them now into detail, just mentioning randomly a couple of them, uh, changes within uh, the economic sphere. So the fact that you, that possession of huge amounts of land was not the only way to secure wealth and to secure uh, influence. Uh, and parallel to that, of course, there is the rise changes in the intellectual sphere more narrowly taken and the rise of, uh, of what we call sciences, modern sciences, that also partly mirror this crisis of authority and influence the crisis of authority in the sociopolitical sphere. Uh, we have at the beginning of this modern time, and some would claim throughout the modern period, basically two kinds of responses to this crisis, crisis of legitimacy and crisis of authority. One is conservative or conservatism. This is how usually uh, the story is presented to us. Uh, and this conservative approach has to do with uh, an attempt to secure some of the continuities. It dwells on tradition, concepts such as tradition, uh, also community that is based in reality or fictionally, it doesn't matter so much, based on blood ties, so uh, where social political community is imagined as a kind of continuation or expansion of family and family uh, ties. And there, within this conservative approach, uh, we are often told religion actually plays an important role and churches play an important role because partly uh, they were in close alliances with political authorities in the previous period. So we of course, can find authors who approach it this way. And this is one way to understand uh, the concept of conservatism and uh, the response to this crisis. Basically trying to reinterpret some of the pre-modern uh, social and political ideas and also institutions within the changing uh, environment. The other response we are often told is uh, quite different and that's liberal or liberalism uh, and we are usually uh, we usually see liberalism uh, along the lines of uh, uh, the primacy of uh, individualism of self-interest together with that private property of course and civil liberties and of course that it is in contrast to the conservative approach uh, normally secular, maybe not at the very beginning, but later on, something that also affirms secular uh, values and secular sphere as opposed 
to the predominance of religious ideas and religious institutions. And of course, very often we add to this the role of science in the advancement of human knowledge and also human society. But this image uh, is uh, very simplistic and very often misleading. And one reason why it's misleading is that in one sense, both conservative and liberal approach to the sociopolitical sphere are actually in one sense secular and in another sense also secular religious. And most of the rest of my presentation will actually be about unpacking a little bit more why. Why there is this uh, embedded secular religious dimension uh, within modern political thinking and then also, of course, uh, political practice as a way to reinvent or reimagine social and political sphere after uh, the collapse of what was before of some of the typically medieval uh, understandings of, of the sphere and political and social institutions. In liberalism, we find some of those elements that characterize in a very fundamental way, quintessential way, modern life, what we very often identify with modernity. Uh, one of them is skepticism toward ver vertical authority, and especially authority understood uh, as a personal source of personal, uh, person as, as a source of power. So personal power as the major source of authority within a political and social sphere. We are often told that this is how and why, one of the reasons how and why liberalism is somehow naturally merged with democracy, uh, as opposed to many conservative approaches that have been affirming, not just at the beginning of the modern age, but also up to now, uh, certain types of aristocracies, aristocratic rule, uh, we have liberalism or monarchy for that matter, we have liberalism that actually questions that and uh, because it questions authority of the church or of the king or our aristocracy, it actually promotes, uh, promotes uh, democracy. And this is something we can also see nowadays when many circles that uh, call themselves liberal or are labeled as liberal uh, question and are especially sensitive to the issue of prominent strong uh, individuals in the political life that actually wherever they see one person being very predominantly exposed in a, in a society as the most influential uh, or presented as the most influential uh, figure we have a kind of natural almost instinctual criticism toward that and questioning that that society and that kind of uh, system cannot be democratic so that something must be wrong there and uh, should be changed. We also have one of the attempts to re-establish this socio-political sphere on some foundations when it was uh, impossible to simply claim uh, that uh, that foundation is somehow legitimized by the divine uh, authority, divine sanction, was also to ground human activities and society on one concept of nature. It's quite interesting to see how nature came to be this secularized religious concept in modernity, uh, and there are many stages in that process. We cannot uh, even mention them now, but the end result was that nature appeared uh, as this foundation, no matter how we understand it mechanistically, biologically, and so on, uh, was the foundation of human activities and societies, which is all the elements that we find already in Locke, uh, John Locke. And within that context, out of nature, natural uh, environment and the natural state of affairs, where we have individuals and we have also private property 
as something that naturally uh, goes with individuals, we have society as an organized uh, form of human uh, life based on social contract. And we also find in Locke, and is very uh, often later repeated, the idea that liberalism really is about securing life, the right of life, freedom, liberty, and private property, that these are the core values, the core principles, uh, what liberalism stands for. The problem there is, of course, that both liberty uh, and up to a point life later on, but primarily liberty at the beginning was closely associated with private property. And one way in which already Locke uh, demonstrated the need for a continuous perpetuation of the social contract is, for example, inheritance. Uh, the existence of uh, inheritance laws that actually perpetuate political system uh, and social contract and also secure uh, the individual, uh, secure individual and private property because that is the way to secure human life. Uh, Locke, of course, was not that pessimistic about this uh, primordial uh, state prior to the social contract as Hobbes, uh, but nevertheless, there is an implicit idea that there is uh, something painful about human life in the world, especially in its natural state. And therefore social contract and social organization, once it is secularized in the sense that it departed from more traditional Christian understandings of the connection between the metaphysical and the sociopolitical, that it needs to be secured somehow and the way to do it is through this organized uh, social life based on social contract. To quote here uh, Sheldon Wallin commenting on liberalism and liberal theory, in reality, homo economicus of liberal theory was a creature not so much obsessed by the quest for gain as much as one frightened by the ever-present prospect of loss. Bankruptcy is perhaps the greatest and most humiliating calamity that can befall on innocent man. In, modern, in the modern context and within the modern paradigm. Related to that, we have, so private property really comes from the very beginning as something very fundamental, which is not simply addition to this anthropology uh, and the primary values of securing life and freedom, but in a certain sense is the necessary, uh, necessary way to secure uh, those other values. Out of that, we can actually look at liberalism as uh, a theory, ideology, if you will, but also way of life, way of organizing social sphere where security, stability, but also middle way of dealing with things come forth as primary values. Because all of them are related to the idea of securing private property. One's reputation is vital for one's business. A good opinion of others is vital for one's uh, social standing, and of course, one's possibility to advance within society. And as some of these authors pointed out, unheroic acts uh, are what really modern liberalism promotes. Not heroic acts, but unheroic acts. Therefore, also, T. bourgeois mentality is something that we can connect with liberal outlook. And this all becomes really the source of liberal conservatism. So it is not much the need to abandon the old, 
but actually to preserve the newly established order uh, that reflects, of course, the interests and the logic of the new class, bourgeois class, becomes something uh, that is embedded in liberalism. And why liberalism is uh, bourgeois ideology par excellence. The need to conform to social norms and society as such, of course, becomes the source of oppression. And as much as uh, individual private property was initially an attempt to secure the space of liberty, to actually enable also social mobility, in the long run, because it needs to be secured, it needs to be uh, built into the very fabric of society, it turns out to actually uh, require conservatism as as ideology that can save it and enable uh, the perpetuation of the mode of production, but also of social classes. If this is uh, what liberalism produced already by the end of the 18th and uh, most definitely the 19th century. Then, as it was also pointed out in literature, panopticon, Bentham's panopticon, becomes really the ideal of liberalism, uh, where there is the promotion of democracy, but in a very special sense, as a way to buy into the predominant ideological narrative within society. Everyone ideally should be exposed to everybody else. There is a requirement for transparency, but that transparency is there to make sure that actually there is conformity and there is a certain uh, element of uh, bringing everyone together, equalizing attempt in the sense that all the dangerous and potentially disturbing ideas, especially revolutionary ones, are safely filtered out or reduced to the minimum. And this is also how private property, together with this social uh, ideological conformity, how it becomes source of oppression in the end. Some theories pointed out that this is how liberalism managed to narrow down uh, the whole understanding of the political to the economic, economic issues. That the sphere domain of economy becomes actually understood as par excellence uh, manifestation of the political, which of course is radically different from uh, pre-modern, but also some modern ideas that do represent variations on uh, these uh, initial interventions that liberalism provided. Thus, we end up with a world where economic phenomena become social phenomena par excellence, and a symbolic representation of that is nowadays mostly GDP. We all hear about GDP and we use it as a way to basically measure uh, the success of the entire social sphere. And of course, as soon as you look at what it means to have high GDP, how, what, how it's structured, and so on and so forth, uh, you realize that it is a very misleading uh, way to measure even just social and even socioeconomic development, let alone all other sides of uh, success within one society. Markets take over society and they are expected to tell us how to live, how to organize societies. They become this ultimate criterion and the business logic ultimate 
epistemology that explains social processes requires us to do this or that, uh, compels the entire political sphere to move this or the other direction. It is enough nowadays to say, well, markets demand this, or markets will not look at it favorably, or the markets will turn, react negatively against this and that to frighten uh, every politician and, of course, to make them move into the desirable uh, direction. But this is already something that goes back to the very early uh, liberal thinkers. The state was understood there primarily as the organization which needs to take care of private property and secure the possibility to pursue happiness, of course, uh, Locke's and then Jefferson's uh, formulation, but this happiness, of course, would become understood primarily in economic terms. And this is where we uh, come to modern capitalism as this quint essential phenomenon that shapes modern societies, uh, that in many ways defeated traditional conservative, the way conservatism is normally presented, as we saw, liberalism is also very conservative. But those traditional conservative, more aristocracy or pre-modern types of society inclined tendencies, capitalism defeated them because uh, of many of its properties that more traditionalist and pre-modern oriented ideologies didn't have. It had a universalizing imperial potential that of course became very prominent already in the age of uh, great empires and Western colonialism. But it especially becomes, again, uh, very important for uh, the present moment when we face, again, the dilemma whether nation states are that useful, successful, and good model of political organization uh, because it became clear something that couldn't have become so clear uh, to the early generations of liberal. Uh, thinkers, uh, some of them believe that actually uh, somehow the contradiction between capitalism and nation state would be overcome. For example, because uh, rich businessmen would actually demonstrate loyalty to their local polity. But the later development, of course, uh, witnessed that that is not something to be counted on. Capitalism also has, uh, and capitalism, this advantage that it diminishes the importance of blood ties. And it is in a very fundamental way anti-aristocratic, even anti-nation and culture. It has a potential to transcend it, and it actually needs to trans transcend them uh, in order to expand and in order to accumulate even more uh, wealth. And ultimately, it does not foster loyalty to the state, to the polity. It actually diminishes it. So there are various ways in which liberalism uh, tried to make up for this deficiency. And that's why liberalism needed to actually borrow from some of those some elements that we typically perceive as conservative in order to make up for this uh, deficiency. Uh, and that's what we have in the most popular form of a modern state, which is state uh, capitalist organization, where capitalism is there, but in symbiosis with say structures that are supposed to secure uh, the privileges of the super wealthy sector, which very often uh, in all sorts of complicated ways 
uh, influences directly uh, the political sphere and makes sure that the legislation is uh, the right one. Uh, but at the ideological level, we have the elements of patriotism, for instance, that you very often hear from uh, liberal minds, uh, the need to defend our values or our national interest, for instance. So something that's very conservative, but uh, uh, very often used for the purposes of, of the liberal ideological, liberal ideological projects. And this picture leads us to uh, this uh, need to actually revive religious and secular religious narratives and elements in order to sustain uh, modern forms of political organizations. And that this is something that we find both on what we commonly call liberal and conservative or sometimes left and, and right side. It started with uh, a clear recognition that religion is needed. Locke was one of those who, who recognized that. But it evolved in the sense that uh, traditional expressions of religiosity were incorporated and turned into servants of this secular religious project, which we call modern state or modern political organization, where loyalty is required from citizens, not to some transcend, transcendent God, someone who's out there, someone who's taken out of the political sphere, but the loyalty is required to this socio-political sphere as such, which of course has its own power dynamics and so on and so forth. And this is the invention, of course, I'm not saying here anything new, uh, the invention of uh, modern states and the modern social sphere as such, as a kind of deity, as a kind of secularized version of religious ideas, uh, which requires sacrifices, which requires obedience, and when it inspires heroic acts, that is, of course, uh, in defense of the sociopolitical as such and the predominant ideological system. Of course, this is a way, going back to uh, what I started with, with the crisis of metaphysical foundations and the crisis of authority, this was the way to supplement this newly uh, envisioned social political reality with some stability and also to inspire people to actually uh, develop it to uh, buy into into the dominant ideology to defend it when needed and let us remember that most of the modern period actually uh, has been the period of conflicts and wars and it is very difficult to inspire people to go to war or to die for, let's say, business interests of somebody else. Uh, but you can inspire them if you create a strong ideology that would have ingredients of the religious and mystical uh, dimensions to it. That, that way you can inspire people to actually die in defense of what is presented to them as their country or their polity or their way of life, as it's sometimes called. But nowadays, of course, we are again in a situation where because of many changes, uh, these paradigms are in a crisis. And the foundations of the socio-political reality are again uh, questioned. They are not, they don't appear as clear and self-evident as at some earlier times, in the time, for example, of revival of, or creation of Western nationalisms. From the conservative side, the problem is, of course, uh, the changing map 
of almost all, especially Western countries. Uh, societies are becoming much less homogeneous. They become much more multicultural. Uh, and this, of course, brings instability if you understand society as something that is supposed to be one harmonious whole that perpetuates, perpetuates tradition uh, and uh, especially is linked directly to one religious tradition. On the other hand, that approach, which we could also call nationalistic, in some cases, at least more uh, extreme cases, is also discredited uh, by the experience of extreme forms of nationalism um, during the 20th century. The liberal approach, of course, has a problem because this complexity uh, and the lack of one homogeneous or one predominant culture uh, or religious tradition uh, that can inspire people to actually uh, be loyal to this one polity, that is also disintegrating through the uh, processes of globalization. Capital is what is spreading all over the place and is using everything it can locally, local power structures to sustain itself and uh, uh, spread even more. But the ideology that could secure stability in this society is something that's questionable because we still have, uh, formally speaking, uh, in most uh, parts of the world nowadays, nation states, some kind of nation states with nation state organization. And we have the presence of this transnational uh, capitalism that actually causes local instabilities. Uh, one way to uh, provide an answer from this, how we are usually told, liberal side, is of course to appeal to something that appears as a universal uh, value and universally implementable value, which very often doesn't really correspond to local, local realities. If we take a look at Europe, just as a micro case of, as an illustration of some of these processes, we are uh, nowadays faced mostly, uh, when you go virtually in any European country, with a choice uh, and a kind of ideological blackmail. Either you are pro-EU, pro-European Union, uh, which basically means pro-European Union structures, and its socio-economic and political uh, organization and ideology, and that's labeled liberal, uh, and is a kind of continuation of some of the liberal ideas, or you have an alternative that's uh, presented as the right-wing or conservative alternative, which basically tries to reclaim uh, nation states and tradition and these more narrowly taken conservative elements from the past. But both are actually incapable to deal with uh, problems that we are faced with. So they both try to offer solutions, some of them invented two or 300 or more years ago, but without actually uh, taking into account uh, many of the factors and social dynamics that has changed in the meantime. And this, of course, uh, leads us to hard questions, such as how can we think of the foundations of both local and global societies, local and global polity? Given both this ideological baggage that because of Western expansion, Western imperialism became in the meantime ideological baggage of the entire world. It doesn't need to be that way, but most of the time it is. And on the other hand, real power dynamics and real power structures primarily uh, manifested in the form of uh, multinational corporations but also powerful governments that are often 
in symbiosis with them, sometimes in a mutual clash. Can we think of a polity without grand unifying narratives? Some postmodern thinkers would uh, criticize modern ideological pros prospects precisely because they would say, well, every time you try to offer some unifying and universalizing uh, narrative, ideological narrative, that actually justifies, conceptualizes, rationalizes, legitimizes social and political uh, reality and, and structures within the society, you are actually creating an oppressive narrative. Uh, so we should go beyond that. But how to move beyond that when we know that there is a need for something, let's call it naively, above near human. There is a need for some religious or pseudo-religious narratives, and those narratives were, as we saw both uh, what we uh, usually call modern liberalism and modern conservatism, not to mention others, uh, much more obvious, such as state communism and Nazism and so on. There is a need for them not only to sustain sociopolitical reality, but also to sustain our very existence in this world. How to maintain is also one question. How to maintain the complexity of social organization of contemporary societies, but reduce their oppressiveness? Is a possible answer in the return to local communities? Is it possible to have a more horizontally organized political entities? Is it a way to maintain democracy, which actually becomes a true victim of these processes? Because what we realize nowadays, but of course to many thinkers it was clear even 200 years ago, uh, is that democracy and liberalism do not go hand in hand. Up to a point they are mutually exclusive. It is not terribly difficult to also demonstrate how conservatism especially in some forms, can also be non-democratic and even anti-democratic, especially if we go for a kind of multicultural uh, versions of democracy. So virtually none of the dominant ideological positions and political philosophies uh, really advocates for democracy. It advocates on a rhetorical level, of course, but without democratizing potential, without liberating potential. And that is a real danger actually of liberalism because it occupies certain space in uh, social and ideological sphere, which is supposed to be promoting uh, democratic and leftist ideas. But in reality, it becomes very conservative and very anti-democratic. Uh, many of those tradition-oriented approaches also claim democracy, but in an exclusivist way, democracy for certain social groups or certain uh, kinds of cultures, religions, families, and so on and so forth. So can democracy be maintained or reaffirmed especially because the actual power structures and power dynamic that we witness to is also anti-democratic. So in a certain sense, both, both social and political and economic processes that are unfolding to a large extent are anti-democratic. Big capital, international capital doesn't need democracy. Uh, big states and conglomerates also are very skeptical of democracy because also, they would lose their position and power if it were uh, generally implemented. And we are stuck with predominant ideological narratives. Some of them affirm democracy, even conservatives, of course, affirm democracy in a certain sense. But in actual reality, uh, all try to undermine democratizing processes. 
These are the questions with which I would like to conclude this brief uh, reflection and invite you to comment, to give your perspectives, your insights, or ask questions. And if uh, you uh, took my advice and took a nap uh, during this presentation, you can also tell us if any of these issues popped up in your dreams and if they are any stranger than the processes, actual processes that we see in the socio-political life. Thank you.